Check Podcasts. Hi, welcome to Chamber Chats. I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce, coming to you, as always, from the podcasting studios of Czech Television, one of our chamber champions. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, as always, that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen-speaking nations, the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And this program, Chamber Chats, is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union, and by C-SPAN Victoria Shipyards. So, you know that game where I say a word and then you say the first word that pops into your mind. Let's let's do that right now. Okay, you ready? Okay. Okay. Coffee. Does the word so it's going to be coffee shop, coffee house, coffee and donuts, uh, coffee meeting. Coffee is such a huge part of our culture, and coffee is something that never forget. We can source locally. Whatever you might buy may or may not be from a local source, but we want to talk about that and overall the role that coffee plays in our lives. I want to welcome Ben Cram in. Ben is the co-owner of Fernwood Coffee, a past Chamber Business Award winner, as a matter of fact. Ben, how are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. So in the big picture, you know, it, it almost seems like an overstatement to say this or, or um, oversimple, but what's the significance of coffee in our culture? Uh, I think... You know, dating back to the first coffee houses when people didn't really brew coffee at home, you know, in in Europe, it has always been um, kind of an alternative to the pub where people are a lot more clear headed. And then with the addition of coffee, they became even more so kind of the effects of caffeine that in the very early days in the history of coffee houses, they were considered sort of places where revolution would would grow from and things like that. And I think in the modern version, you get a watered down kind of version of that where it is it has become kind of the community hub as far as serving coffee publicly. Um, you know, we've been on the same intersection roughly. We've had a, a move one street over, but for 16 years as owners and the shop itself has been there since 89. Mm. Um, and we have, you know, a group of morning guys who sat who sit together and have been since the early 90s every day wow. they're there 7 a.m when we open our doors having their coffee and it's it's really has grown into a, a community hub where um you know obviously yes it's a business but it sir it, it means a lot more to a lot of people i mean when you think about the role that coffee plays in our everyday lives you talk about first thing in the morning you get up you have coffee people get together for a coffee meeting uh, it's just so and, the, and we're a coffee culture aren't we i mean this community greater victoria we're all about the coffee, right? Definitely. Yeah. We have a ton of really good independent roasters um, who, you know, per capita, I would, I would guess we're one of the highest in the country. Um, and there's, you know, just a ton of people in Victoria who take it really seriously, do a great job. Um, there were people there doing it before I, I was who mentored me. And, you know, just this morning I had a meeting with a guy who wants to start roasting up island and want, and just you know ask for a sit down to ask you know what are the pitfalls what what should i avoid so you know i i got that from the victoria coffee community and i'm happy to pass it on to other people too yeah we have our coffee we have our uh, craft brewers we have our local distillers we have our local wineries we have a cidery we even have somebody making mead so when it comes to to beverages, we got it covered here, but you know, it's it's a little bit different around the world, right? Like if you sat and had a coffee in a piazza in Europe, that's different than having a coffee somewhere in Asia or in Africa. How does that compare to the way we enjoy our coffee here on a social side? Uh, I think the social side is the commonality, and then the differences are sort of the how and when. Um, you know, you look at Ethiopia, and it's like a huge part of their of their cultural identity. There's a whole ceremony going that goes along with coffee service. And if you're invited to a coffee service in an Ethiopian home, it's a, it's a special thing. It's like a Japanese tea service. It's not just a casual, have a cup of coffee. But at the end of the day, I think, like I said, it's it, the commonality is it brings people together. Um, it has that natural energizing effect. So, you know, if people are trying to be creative in a, in a group, it, it can often kind of be a lubricant to uh, get ideas flowing faster. Um, and then, yeah, where you see the differences is sort of how people brew and, and, 
and what they put in it and what time of day they think is appropriate. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's, the differences are, are, are minor compared to the commonality of that, that bringing people together. Yeah, because we're, you know, we're having this conversation because it, it, coffee is everywhere. It's, it's taken for granted. It's a part of our lives. But the experiences, too, you talk about when you, you get up in the morning and you make your coffee in your favorite mug and you put the cream or the sugar or neither one in it. That's a whole different experience than going to a coffee shop and suddenly the barista gets involved. So talk yeah. about that experience. Well, I mean, I, I think you just get access to um, that sort of perfect cup or closer to that perfect cup when you go and have a, a professional barista making something for you. And it's not even just the person making it. That obviously is a huge part of it, but it's also the equipment is on a, such a different level than, than even high quality home equipment. Because um, it's pretty common that we'll get people who say, how can I make this at home? I have a really good espresso machine. Why doesn't it ever come out like this? Yeah. Why can't uh, I do what you guys do, right? So, you know, what we started doing a few years ago is we'd say, well, after hours tonight, bring your machine down. And uh, one of our baristas, we started doing training courses where people would get training on their machine. So I'd say, you know, if, if anyone on earth can get a, an amazing cup of coffee out of your machine, it's the guy behind our bar. He'll come in tonight and work with you and he'll teach you how to get the most out of that machine that you have. Isn't that cool? Because it's amazing yeah. to watch that, you know, when the foam and the froth and you, your cup is put in front of you and it's got that looks like a fern leaf design on the front of it and stuff. That's, that's an art, man. That really is an art, isn't it? It is. I'm, I'm very bad at it considering <laughs> that I own a coffee company. You have people for that though, right? That's... I can, I can fake it. I can, I can make it sort of, it looks like an onion. But, it, uh... Oh, oh, well, it may be something. I like onions. I'm okay with that. So, <laughs> you know, we're talking about this being so uber local and you as Fernwood Coffee. We're going to get into the whole process in a second, but how, let's put this in perspective. How big is the coffee industry across the planet? I mean, the easiest stat that you hear thrown around a lot is that it's the second largest traded commodity on the planet behind crude oil. So um, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and more and more what we're seeing, you know, when I first got into coffee, you'd go to a coffee growing country and they actually, a lot of the countries didn't consume a lot of coffee. It was all being exported. And that's changed. You know, when you go to Brazil or Colombia now, you can go to beautiful high-end cafes the, that you, similar to what you'd see here or anywhere else, uh, which wasn't the case, you know, a, a decade ago. So it's, it's really spread. Um, if you track, so there's the World Barista Championship and every year they crown one person, the World Barista Champion. And it's, it's a, a presentation and a service that you do to judges who are judging your customer service, the taste of your coffee, your technique, everything. And we've seen more and more uh, growing, coffee growing countries uh, winning the World Barista Championship, which is just huge for the industry to have it come full circle like that. As the pandemic began these two and a half years ago, and we saw things disappearing from the shelves, the toilet paper and the vegetables in the front lot, I know some people that were panicking that their coffee source was going to disappear. And I want to talk about that next. Our guest on Chamber Chat today is Ben Cram. He is the uh, co-owner of Fernwood Coffee. So at the outset, uh, people were wondering, Ben, what, what's going to happen if we run out of coffee when the supply chain suddenly got all mixed up by the pandemic and stuff? Did you have any sort of that panic that you were going to lose your source of coffee? We, we did. I wouldn't say it was a panic. It was more of like a, a let's prepare. So we, uh, we have great suppliers that we work with and a long, long standing relationships. And so they were able to extend our credit and send us, you know, four or five times the coffee we'd normally get on a delivery. And we just kept some extra stockpiled and then we resumed our normal ordering habits. So we always had some extra. And it was kind of one of those classic Victoria business stories where um, uh, Paul from Spinnaker's has a warehouse and we got all this coffee and nowhere to put it. And Paul, without hesitation, is like, oh, you can park it here. We got room for you. Um, so it was it was pretty huge for us to uh, to, you know, have that support from our suppliers and from other local businesses. So we we kind of took that mentality with everything. Uh, the one that was really scary was 
was our packaging. We cut it really close trying to get packaging here because the shipping lanes were all moving so slowly. Yeah, and that, that same thing with the shipping lanes, plus at the production end of it at the other part of the world, um, mm -hmm. we're not functioning at the usual levels because of the pandemic. Yes. So that all kind of, but yeah, you mentioned Paul Hadfield at Spinnakers. He's a, uh, another of our chamber champions. He's just one of those guys that steps up and does the right thing. So always a good chance to shout out to him as well. So um, is it better now than it was two and a half years ago? Uh, it's, it, it actually, I wouldn't say it's better. I would say we're all just more used to it. Oh, okay. And you're like things, the lead time on things never went back to what it used to be. So something that I used to order six weeks ahead, I'm ordering 18 weeks ahead now, which is hard on the storage side of things and hard, you know, cause you got to come up with the capital to have more inventory that's just sitting there, but it's kind of the only way to do it in this new, new world, so to speak. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's take that journey that gets that beautiful coffee into our cup at Fernwood Coffee. Where does your coffee come from? Where do the beans come from? Uh, we get coffee from all over the world. I mean, co coffee's grown in a band around the equator, basically any country that's between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. The equatorial zone, um, yeah. It, yes, is, is coffee growing countries. Um, so we get coffees from Africa, uh, Central and South America mainly, uh, once in a while, Indonesia, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, but the bulk of our coffees uh, are, are sort of go-to is uh, Brazil. Um, that's kind of one of our base coffees that goes in a lot of our blends and things. And that's a relationship where we've worked with the same farm for almost 10 years now. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're going to Brazil every year and and meeting with him and he's got, you know, hundreds of samples set aside for us. And we really get to pick, you know, of his crops and his family members who have other farms, we kind of get the first shot at all the, the best coffees that they have because of this longstanding relationship. So, yeah. um, yeah, we we're bringing coffee in from, from quite a few different places. Were you able to take those trips during the pandemic? No, no, they were on hold. Uh, and in fact, the the main guy in brazil who we're in contact with him and our head roaster have become really tight hmm. close friends and they were supposed to be at each other's weddings and oh no <laughs> none of that worked out because of because of pandemic but so we're, we're doing this because you're local and your product is amazing but when when you talk about you're dealing with a guy there is a farmer that you deal with directly you're not going through some sort of a broker or something you have a direct relationship with the people that are sourcing your product let me ask you this the big brands like the Maxwell House and uh, Nabob and all these other folks, how do they source what they do to produce things on that volume? Uh, they're generally buying commodity coffees, which uh, the coffee we buy is called specialty. So it's in a different grade. And basically, you coffee can get assessed and scored. There's a, there's a, a system that's used worldwide. And coffees that score between 85 and 100 are considered specialty and they kind of operate outside the commodity market in that their price will go up and down as the commodity price goes up and down but they're a much higher price point than that base commodity price uh, so the farmer gets more money um, you know there there's it, it's a whole conversation because there's more risk for them to create this better product uh, their yield is not as high but they get a higher price um, and they get, you know, if they're the people they're partnering with on our end as a roaster is, is good, then they're getting some guarantee that like, Hey, even if it's not the perfect crop, we're still, we're still committed to you. We're not going to leave you high and dry. Uh, and then you get those, the big companies that are basically buying the commodity coffees. So that would be a farm. They have a lot more mechanical procedures. They're not hand picking the coffees they're going through once. So they kind of wait till most of it is ripe and then they go through and pick everything. Mm. Whereas at the high end, they'll go through early and pick anything that ripened early. Then they'll do a pass and pick the bulk of it. Then they'll do a late pass and pick any of the less sort of late bloomer ones that, that come to ripeness a bit after. So, you know, it's just a lot more time and care put into uh, getting a better fin final product. Which is why a product like yours tastes better than the mass produced ones because that, that sort of Absolutely. care goes into it. Yeah. So when they go through and just take everything, whether it's ripe or not, is that what makes some coffee bitter? Uh, yeah. I mean, it can have all kinds of detriments. Bitter or bitter is, is often something that's actually 
through the roasting process. If it's mm. over roasted, it can be too bitter. Um, but you'll get sort of grassy, dull flavors. Um, and, you know, just like any of the tasting notes associated with those coffees, if you were to run them through the cupping procedure that I was talking about, that formal procedure, they'd score very low and you'd get all kinds of negative words in the tasting notes. Um, so that's, you know, often why those coffees are roasted quite dark because the darker you roast, the more all coffees sort of start to taste the same and you're tasting more the effects of caramelization than the actual, uh, you know, flavors of that, that coffee. Yeah. And there is a variation in what the beans taste like, right? According to where they come from in the world. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Same as wine, you know, you have your terroir and different people love coffees from different countries. Uh, it's really common that we'll get people come in and say, oh, I, do you have Ethiopian coffee? I love Ethiopian coffee yeah. and things like that. So uh, definitely, you know, that's our single origin coffees. When you read the label, it'll tell you the name of the farm, how it was processed, the varietal of, of plant that it was. So you get a bunch of information. Yeah, so access to that is why local is better, and that's why we're talking with Fernwood Coffee today. What I want to talk about next is what happens when those beans actually get here. Our chamber chat today is all about coffee. We're talking with Ben Cram, who is the co-owner of Fernwood Coffee, along with his wife, by the way. We'll mention that's the other co-owner. Okay, so you've gone to Brazil, wherever it might be, to source the beans. The beans arrive here. They show up at your location in Fernwood. Then what do you do? Uh, the very first step for us when we get new coffees in is a bunch of test roasts. Uh, so we graph everything, uh, time and temperature, and we'll roast the coffee a bunch of different ways because you can apply heat and airflow differently through the roast process. And we'll, you know, we kind of have some default profiles that we try to get that coffee tasting the best we think we can. And once we, once we dial in a profile and each coffee is different in how we're gonna end up roasting it, then we'll lock that in and that's how we'll roast that coffee until we run out of it. So uh, that's a method called profile roasting where you can really, you know, our job is to try and get the best, most sort of subtle nuances out of each coffee that we can. People often say that one of the great oxymorons of the world is decaffeinated coffee. But when somebody wants to create that, how, how do you remove the caffeine? Is it in the roasting that the caffeine gets taken no. out of the coffee? No, no, it's a process before it gets to us. And so there's, there's chemical, there's a chemical method. And then there's uh, a method called Swiss water, which uh, actually all the Swiss water coffee in the world is the Swiss water plant is, uh, in, in Vancouver, in Burnaby. Actually. Okay. So you, you know, if you're drinking Swiss water decaf, it came through Vancouver at some point to be decaffeinated. And it's basically a process where they soak the unroasted coffee and then they're able to remove the caffeine from the water and then they rehydrate and, uh, I'm really simplifying it here, but basically reinfuse the coffee with its own flavor, uh, minus the caffeine. Okay. I looked up some stats. Uh, the top 10 coffee consuming countries in the world per capita for coffee consumption, the majority of the top 10 are actually in Scandinavia, mm -hmm. but Canada is in the top 10 of per capita consumption of coffee. We're ahead of the United States even. Why do you think that is? Tim Hortons. <laughs> <laughs> and good stuff there like you yours. Go. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, um, you know, Australia, I'm going to guess Australia was on that list. I believe so. Yeah. And they have a coffee culture that's often considered to be kind of five or six years ahead of the rest of the world. And I feel like culinary wise, you know, we, I think we draw a lot of cues from, from that culture. Um, more than we do even from the states like the, they're sort of ahead of, ahead of the game in that and i know for me as a as an owner and operator i keep my eye on what's going on there more than in the states um yeah i'm not sure why why canada is more it might might be colder weather i don't know yeah i was thinking that might be part of it right because a good half of the states is warm a good part of the year yeah. so maybe that's it too so let's talk about your product and the, tell me about the, the various ways that you offer fernwood coffee what are the different brands and, and ways that you sell it so we have um our fair trade organic blends which uh are what you'd see in grocery stores and um 
and they're really good for like large scale food service. Like uh, we're we just went into the new the new uh, commissary building at UVic, mm. uh, and, and you know they're great blends for for places like that that are really high volume because you have multiple staff and they're kind of easier coffees to work with. They're very straightforward coffees, uh, and then we have our single origins and, mm. and kind of like a, a top shelf or boutique line. Um, and those are coffees that we're sourcing from specific indiv individual farms uh, and roasting, not blending with other coffees generally. So it's kind of like uh, a single malt scotch versus a versus a blended whiskey kind of idea. Right. Uh, so you mentioned in the store, we can certainly get it directly from Fernwood Coffee, but you're in you're in the you're in like thrifty foods and places like that. Yeah. Where, yeah where, yeah. Do, where do we find Fernwood Coffee? So we're in Thrifty, Save On, Whole Foods, most of the major grocery stores, uh, Root Cellar, uh, Peppers. We, we love all the little, you know, local independents, uh, Market on Yates and Millstream. Those places have been supporting us since day one. Uh, Market on Yates was our very first grocery store to ever put us on the shelves. And, uh, um, and then a lot of food service as well. Uh, Zambri's brews our coffee and, uh, you know, lots of other restaurants and cafes around town. Yeah. Well, local supporting local. What's the best way to enjoy Fernwood coffee? <laughs> um, I always tell people that, that they should enjoy coffee, like throw away any rules and what any expert has told them and enjoy what they actually enjoy the taste of. So if someone says, Oh, Someone told me never to drink dark coffee. I'm like, well, do you like the taste of the dark coffee? Then, then by all means, drink the dark coffee. Uh, definitely, it's worth an experience to come and try our coffee on one of our bars because the staff work with it so much and know it so well that uh, that's a good jumping off point. And they're also great at recommending, you know, what beans to buy based on, you know, if someone comes in and says, I, I have an espresso machine, which coffee should I buy? They'll have great options for them. And and reasons why they're choosing those options. Best way to store beans and in the fridge or on the shelf? Shelf. Shelf in an airtight container. Drip or bodum? Uh, for me, it depends on the coffee that I'm drinking because they have two different effects on flavor. So if I'm drinking a coffee and I really want to experience the body and it's like a really heavy, almost oily coffee, uh, I would go bodum because that metal filter lets caught more coffee oils through. And then, uh, if I'm drinking a really delicate, subtle flavored coffee, I'd want a paper filter because it it really you get a cleaner, cleaner flavor profile, less body. Shop local as always, and keep that in consideration. And consider Fernwood Coffee if you haven't done so yet. Uh, ben, thanks for the information. Thanks for the conversation. Yes, thanks for having me. I, I was uh, very happy to get the invite. And thanks. It's a coffee chat, I guess. It's actually it's a chamber chat. I'm Bruce Williams, and we'll see you soon for another one.